Oops. Okay. Okay. Welcome, Jay. Thank you for your presentation tonight and um, and uh, the Jerry Nunnally Memorial Lecture. And we're very happy to have you with us. Well, thank you. I'm extremely pleased to to be here and to be able to you know share what is probably my most favorite subject of all the many things that I'm interested in. And that is the history of Hanover, the history of the Upper Valley. And uh, so this is, uh, let's get sort of get the, um, uh, the salesmanship out of the way and then settle down to the more scholarly bits that we have to talk about. Um, so I've got a book that the History Press is, has sent to press and it should be available um, for sale the end of, uh, or sometime during the month of August. And it's called Lost Hanover, New Hampshire. And it's a uh, book of about a, a nine, uh, 90 illustrations and about 50,000 uh, words about all the buildings that have come and gone in downtown Hanover, including the Dartmouth campus. Uh, and, uh, and it was really a whole bunch of fun to put together. It was something I've been planning and wanting to do for a long time. So I sold it to the history press. And last week I saw my last uh, uh, draft of it, uh, which I approved and off it's gone. And so now it's in the printing stages. And, uh, but it was a lot of fun to look at architecturally, you know, how Hanover has evolved over the years, um, you know, how it's been presented by different styles of architecture about a very, very rich history of, of, of uh, not only buildings and people, but events and institutions that have come and gone. So what I've got tonight is sort of pulling a few things out of that um, and dealing and, and, and uh, looking at the how uh, what is now UNH uh, in Durham, New Hampshire had its start on the Dartmouth campus with the New Hampshire College of Agriculture and Mechanical Arts and, uh, and some of the related schools that were around that at the, in the period. And then also looking at um, the earliest uh, uh, buildings that we know that are now gone of the Dartmouth Medical School. And then a really good walkthrough of the original Mary Hitchcock Memorial Hospital, uh, of which I've got some delightful images of and was a truly remarkable building in its day when it was opened in May of uh, 1893. So just a little bit about me, for those of you who don't know me, um, I can't say I was born in Hanover. My family moved here in 1946, but my mother, her doctor was uh, at Brigham Women's Hospital in uh, Boston. So I was born in Boston, like my two older brothers, but came home to Hanover when I was about uh, three or four years um, uh, days old. And uh, I've just always been deeply fascinated by the history of Hanover. I vividly remember being eight and a half years of age during the 1961 bicentennial. And I still got my programs and things that I marked up from that. I remember vividly watching the parade and just being mesmerized by it all. And, um, you know, just collecting stuff on Hanover, the history. And uh, it's been almost an obsession of mine uh, and especially the buildings that have come and gone. By the time I was eight or nine, I knew that I too wanted to be an architect like my father. And uh, I've, been blessed. I've been blessed with having had a wonderful career in, in architecture and I'm still practicing. and plan on doing so uh, you know, for as long as I can. So this is sort of a natural fit and uh, it's uh, fun to trot this out. So the program, as I said, we're gonna look at the New Hampshire College of Agriculture and Mechanical Arts. And then related to that, we're gonna take a quick look at Moore's Indian Charity School because there's a fascinating building related to that, as well as the Chandler School of Science and Arts that was on the Dartmouth campus. And then the second part, as I say, we're gonna take a, a look at the Dartmouth Medical School, the early medical school, all of which is now gone. And we're gonna end up with a nice walk through the Mary Hitchcock Memorial Hospital. And uh, I'm sure that'll bring back memories to, to some and uh, will be a bit of an education to, to others. So if I maneuver my mouse correctly here, so let's start with the New Hampshire College of Agriculture and Mechanical Arts. This was established in Hanover by the New Hampshire State Legislature in 1866 
and it opened two years later in 1898. And it was a direct result of the moral grant or more of the land grant or moral act of 1862, which I think is one of the most significant pieces of legislation ever passed by the United States Congress. It was, ex it was extraordinarily progressive. And I think as far as the country getting a bang for its buck, there has never been anything better. But the act was named for its primary sponsor, Congressman Justin Morrill Smith, from Stratford, Vermont, and his homestead is open to the public. It's a delightful uh, Gothic um, revival homestead in beautiful repair. And, and, um, and he was a, a, a congressman uh, in Vermont. We'll, we'll look at him in a little bit uh, in the next slide. And the basis of the act was it granted 30,000 acres of federal land out in the West to each state for every congressional seat that that state had. And the idea was that the land could then be sold, rented, leased or whatever, and the proceeds would go to the states to establish colleges to teach agriculture and mechanical arts. And this is the most interesting thing for both men and women. Uh, it was, um, the country was expanding a tremendous uh, period of growth during the middle um, um, uh, 19th century during the time of the American Civil War and more progressive politicians were understanding that we needed to better educate both men and women in agricultural practices and mechanical arts, whether that be blacksmithing or steam engines or whatever it might be. So New Hampshire received 50, 150 acres of Western land which it then sold for, uh, uh, I think it was, I think I, my slides a bit blocked here, um, $80,000. And, and instead of starting a new college, which some states did, and, and again, these land grant colleges are, are, are very common. Uh, Cornell is a land grant college. Uh, MIT was a land grant college. The uh, University of, um, of uh, Massachusetts in uh, Amherst is a land grant college. So what New Hampshire chose to do was to not start a new college with the money that it got out of selling these lands, but to form a partnership as it were with Dartmouth College. And because Dartmouth was an established institution with a campus of you know, five established buildings and it had a curriculum and the idea was that, Hanover, that Dartmouth and, um, and the state college could both benefit from each other and each other's presence. So the legislature approved that in 1866. Here's a little bit more about uh, Justin Morrill Smith. As I say, he was from Stratford, just a little bit diagonally across the river and in Vermont. Uh, he was Vermont's lone congressman, as you can see from 1855 to 1867, and then a Vermont state, uh, uh, Vermont um, um, United States Senator from 1867 to 1898. And as I say, over time, 106 land grant colleges were created in the United States. And, uh, and there was a second moral act in 1890 that initiated a lot of uh, tightening up and reforms to what was already an impressive piece of legislation. And it initiated regular government appropriations. So in the late 1860s, 1868 to be exact, 67, the state of New Hampshire started buying land in downtown Hanover. And here's a map done in 1870, uh, within four years of establishing the college and within two years of it opening on the Dartmouth campus. And uh, to the, I don't have a pointer, so I'll try to as best I can, if I were doing this in person, I'd have my laser pointer all over this thing. But to the far uh, left, you can see four buildings next to College Street. Those are the four white buildings on the Dartmouth campus. Cutting horizontally across the page is East Wheelock Street. And then you will see going vertically uh, Park Street, which means South Park Street. And then uh, at the very far right of this map, uh, you'll see a, a house that's marked AP Bulge. And that's that stone house right at the uh, intersection of Rip Road and, uh, and East Wheelock Street. So the state effectively owned all of the land where 
Dartmouth's athletic facilities are uh, between Crosby Street and Park Street, South Park Street, and then all of the land where the uh, um, Valley Road neighborhood is, you know, all of that. And, uh, and this was just the beginning of the land they acquired. Um, so the first building that got built by the state on the Dartmouth campus was Culver Hall. And this sat on the uh, northerly side of East Wheelock Street, uh, opposite Crosby Street, which is a street that cuts in front of the, uh, the stadium. Uh, you can see in the background in the uh, uh, um, uh, left side, uh, you can see the observatory up on the College Park. And then further out of view on the left side would be uh, Reed Hall and the uh, back side of Dartmouth Row. This was quite a building. It was as fine an edu educational building uh, as was then in, uh, in existence in New Hampshire. Um, it uh, uh, was named for David Culver, who was a retired gentleman from Lyme who took a deep interest in the state's undertaking to the point where he had offered the state a 400 acre farm that he had along the Connecticut River in Lyme, but there were problems with the estate. Mr. Culver had died, so the state felt that it was safer to partner with Dartmouth. But nonetheless, he got a building name for himself. And as you can see, it was quite a, quite a facility for its day, quite a piece of architecture. And uh, it sat just raised a little bit above East Wheelock Street, which you see here in the foreground. It was opened in 1873 and uh, was torn down in 1929. Um, this had chemistry labs in it and, um, and physics labs. And as I say, it was quite a facility. Here we see another picture of Culver Hall nearing completion in, the, uh, in front of Culver Hall along the fence line is East Wheelock Street. And up here you see um, uh, Reed Hall and then the backside of uh, Thornton, um, Dartmouth and Wentworth uh, Halls. Uh, and this, all of this open area in the front is now all part of the athletic fields at the Dartmouth Stadium and where the gymnasium is, et cetera. Okay. Uh, across the street from Culver Hall, uh, was erected Conant Hall. And Conant Hall was the front part of the building that you see here was dormitory rooms, uh, residential rooms for students at the, at, the, at the New Hampshire College. And then the back piece, which you see sticking out on the right-hand side um, was the dining facility um, and uh, on the second floor room for some of the help for some of the cooks and whatever. Um, and uh, again, this was done, designed by architect Edward Dow of Concord. Uh, he tried to make the building a little bit more residential feeling in character than Culver Hall across the street. This is a fascinating view of uh, Conant right after it was completed. Uh, and in what you see on the left side, are you, are, can folks see my pointer? So that can substitute for my laser. Um, is the so-called gas plant or gas works uh, that sat about where uh, the Dartmouth heating plant is now, but it was built in 1873 to supply gas for lighting in, uh, in, in the state's buildings, as well as in several of Dartmouth's um, uh, primary buildings like Reed Hall, Dartmouth Hall, and, and for a little bit of for some uh, street lights on Main Street. Um, Obviously, uh, by 1893, uh, the gas plant had become obsolete and it was replaced with Dartmouth's big heating plant. Here's another view of Conant Hall with some additions, uh, porches on the front, a nice entry porch, and then on the kitchen dining room uh, portion, uh, a nice um, uh, porch, side porch, which would have had a very nice view across all of the fields uh, that the uh, college had. Uh, which are now uh, the football stadium, football fields, Leverone Fieldhouse, and tennis courts and all of that. Um, the, the building, um, and we'll get to this in a little bit, but when the New Hampshire College left Hanover in 1893 and sold much of the property to Dartmouth, uh, Dartmouth did acquire Conant Hall. And in 1925, after Topliff Dormitory was built, 
uh, wrapping around two sides of uh, in front of Conan Hall. Conan Hall, the main building, front building was taken down. But if you look carefully, uh, the rear portion without the porches is still extant out back of top lift right next to the uh, heating plant. And it's a little bit of a reminder of, um, of the start that uh, the New Hampshire uh, College had here in Hanover. I think this is a fascinating view taken about 1876 uh, from up on Lebanon Street or Sand Hill, it was then known. But here is Lebanon Street coming down the hill. Here's the intersection with Park Street and Park Street running out. Uh, and then Lebanon Street continuing in to the village. Uh, this area uh, to, the, to the right, or excuse me, to the left is where the school complex now is. It was all Dorrance Courier's large pastures. And then on the um, north or, or side of, the, of uh, Lebanon Street, you can see here's Conant Hall, there's Culver Hall, and there's Dartmouth Hall, uh, and then here's Park Street. And all of these fields in the front were cultivated uh, for crops. And the idea was that uh, students would learn crop rotation, good plowing practices, uh, experimenting with different types of seeds and, and um, uh, cross, uh, you know, who knows what. And then uh, on the east side was more uh, pasture land. And as we'll see in a minute was a large farm. And then as you progressed up Balch Hill and into uh, uh, the Velvet Rocks area, um, you know, there were woodlots, et cetera. Interesting view, um, circa 1876, we see uh, standing from about in front of the top of the hop, the intersection of East Wheelock Street, and this is the view is looking east, and uh, College Street, which takes off to the, uh, to the uh, left. But here we see Culver Hall in all of its magnificent glory, perched above the street and looking down Crosby uh, Street at that point. Crosby Street had been built so that people coming into Hanover from um, the, the east or the south would sort of approach um, uh, Culver Hall up on the hill and have a, have a nice vista of it. And then here is um, uh, Conant Hall. As I say, this back portion still survives. In the front is now uh, the large top lift dorm which was built in 1920, oh, wrong way. So down on the east side of uh, South Park Street was the farm complex built by, developed by the state. And here in the foreground is East Wheelock Street. Um, and cutting across at the middle of the photograph is South Park Street and then East Wheelock Street continuing out of view, heading out to Etna uh, and uh, Balch Hill and Velvet Rocks up behind. So again, all of the um, land, uh, Dartmouth now, now present day Dartmouth land that support their athletic facilities uh, was all crop land. And then um, they, there was a large barn built and this was added to, it became quite a complex before the state left but 100 by, um, a 100 by 50 uh, foot barn, square foot barn. Um, this farmhouse still survives. It's right tight to uh, South Park Street. The outbuildings are gone. And then um, much of this was pasture land down in the Valley Road area. And then going up the side of Balch Hill and Velvet Rocks uh, was cropland, uh, excuse me, was um, uh, uh, woodlot. And again, it was important that students learn everything from, you know, crop management to livestock management to blacksmithing to uh, physics, uh, mathematics, uh, woodlot management. It was really very, very progressive uh, for, for the day. So if we were walking down as many of the students did between Culver Hall, which would be to our um, uh, left, Here's walking down East Wheelock Street uh, towards the intersection with uh, South Park Street. And uh, right in the foreground would be the intersection of uh, Crosby Street. 
And there's the uh, college, uh, the, the agricultural college's barn, which before it received uh, additions and a farmhouse. As I say, the college continued to, that is the New Hampshire, the state college, continued to acquire additional land above and beyond that which they initially had, had acquired by 1870. Uh, again, here's Crosby Street, which had now been, been built. Here's South Park Street, East Wheelock Street, heading up to Etna, and uh, uh, Culver Hall and Conant Hall. This is all pasture land. Here's the farm complex, which we'll see more pictures of in a minute, or here's a picture of it, an engraving of it with the superintendent's house and additional outbuildings. So um, uh, pasture land and then woodlot, because beyond this property line was an additional 155 acres of woodlot and, uh, and uphill pasture. The um, Congress passed an act in uh, 1887 called the Congressional Ex Agricultural Experiment Station Act. And the idea was to um, uh, provide monies to the state um, uh, colleges, land grant colleges, so that they could build facilities to better study, um, you know, um, uh, pasteurization of milk, crop um, um, seeding, and whatever anything that that an agricultural college should be looking at. Uh, and so this magnificent building, which is still standing, some of you might recognize it, on um, uh, South Park Street, uh, was the uh, college's started life as the New Hampshire State uh, College's agriculture, um, uh, agricultural uh, experiment station. It was completed in uh, 1888. I always, as a kid, was always really intrigued with this building, and I remember I had a, a uh, grade school classmate, Jim Sparks, and his family lived up on the second floor of this. And I thought it was the coolest building in the world. I didn't know anything about its history, but I just loved the, the heavy brick with these wonderful uh, brick arches, structural arches. So there's looking across from East Wheelock Street. And you can see the barn and the superintendent's house and then other outbuildings that have been added to the farm complex. Uh, a, um, a windmill for pumping water. And then here is the uh, agricultural station building that you just saw. Of course, um, you know, the um, barn was torn down in 1921. And I can remember as a kid in 1962 when the uh, farmhouse was finally torn down. It had gotten pretty seedy by then. Another view looking from um, up by the Bema, up in the College Park looking down on the uh, uh, New Hampshire uh, State Farm complex circa 1890. And again, there's the big barn. Here's pasture land out in the back. And then the superintendent's house, uh, additional outbuildings and the agricultural uh, station building for experiments and uh, the like. And then uh, beside it, another outbuilding. Um, of course, these two houses are still extant on um, North Park Street. Uh, this one built in 1884 by um, Frank Davison, who had uh, quite a going um, dry goods store on Main Street and built the Davison block. And this was uh, built by Professor Patty of the Agricultural College. Um, and that is still standing and uh, both of these buildings are owned by Dartmouth. So the, let's see if I can get rid of that thing. Nope. So in 1893, the New Hampshire College of Agriculture and Mechanical Arts moved to the Thompson Farm in Durham, New Hampshire. And during the almost 30 odd years that it was in Hanover, it was a very, very rocky relationship. It was one of those things that's sort of like a marriage that looks good in, on paper or, you know, the, you know, a law firm of partners that, you know, in theory looks good, but it was a horrible, miserable relationship. Dartmouth's president at that time, Samuel E. Um, uh, Bartlett, had no use for the college or the agricultural students. He called them Aggies or Dungies. 
and reminded them that they were not Dartmouth students. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, and that sort of set a bad tone. And of course, at that point, Dartmouth was teaching, it was a, it was a regional college of 350 students or so that was teaching a, a, you know, a very classical education. And it had nothing in the world to do with what was being taught at the state college, even though Dartmouth was using the chemistry labs and some of the other facilities of the uh, state college. So Dartmouth and, and the trustees of the state college were fussing that the, call, that the state school was not really being all that it could be. And the Grange and other organizations supporting agriculture in New Hampshire got into the act. And uh, finally, a, um, a gentleman, Benjamin, I think his first name is Thompson, who had a big 400 acre farm in Durham. He was a bachelor. And he wrote into his will that he gifted the, the farm and a considerable amount of money to the state of New Hampshire if the legislature would approve moving the um, New Hampshire State College from Hanover to Durham, which was done after the last class graduated in 1893. So Dartmouth bought from the state Culver Hall for 15,000, Experiment Station for 30,000, which became the first permanent home of the Thayer School of Engineering. It bought all of the state's land between East Wheelock Street, South Park and Lebanon Street and Conant and Allen Hall. Uh, Allen Hall was a big woodworking shop uh, for 15,000, but it only bought about 22 acres of the 300 plus acres of the state experimental farm east of uh, South Park Street uh, for $3,000. The remainder of the land was sold to a fellow John M. Fuller who in turn sold it to Dartmouth in 1921. So that's how Dartmouth ended up with all of the Valley Road, Conant Road, you know, Kingsford Freeman, all the way up the side of Balch Hill, as well as all of the um, 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 uh, so-called Velvet Rocks land. It was in 1921, having acquired it, um, that originally had been parcels pulled together by the state of New Hampshire. So, it's interesting to sort of say, well, why, why did this marriage not work? In spite, you know, and, and part of the problem was, um, was uh, you know, President Bartlett, who just again had no use at all for the, the state um, ag students, which were both men and women. Uh, obviously women were in a minority, but nonetheless, and it somewhat had to do with in, in some ways competing with the Chandler School of Sciences and the Arts at Dartmouth. And, uh, and, and, that, and this is an interesting little side trip that I like to take because again, it's also uh, a little bit of a wonderful architectural tour of what started off as a wonderful building and ended up in, well, it was considered the ugliest building in Hanover by the time it was torn down. But so let's take a little side trip. So Moore's Indian Charity School was established by Dr. Reverend Dr. Eliezer Wheelock in Lebanon Crank, now the town of Columbia, Connecticut, in 1754. And this is basically the, um, the, the forerunner of Dartmouth College. This building still stands on the village green and it's well attended to and painted and uh, kept up by Dartmouth alum. Uh, but this is the earliest of um, uh, Wheelock's teaching, this school, and this is what led to the creation of Dartmouth College and eventually Dartmouth College finding its way and settling in Hanover. And when Dartmouth came to Hanover with charter in hand and great ambitions, along with it came Moore's Indian Charity School, although only by that point something that existed on paper and was not really a functioning school at that point, having been somewhat swallowed up by the infant Dartmouth College. But nonetheless, after some litigation in the 1820s as to the fate, the eventual fate of Moore's Indian Charity School, it was, it was uh, uh, agreed by lawsuits that uh, the college needed to build a facility for Moore's Indian Charity School. And so this magnificent uh, academy building was uh, designed and, and constructed by architect Amy Young, who originally was from uh, Lebanon, New Hampshire, 
He did that, he designed three out of four of the white buildings on Dartmouth Row. Uh, the most, uh, the, the best of those, of course, was the last one, Reed Hall. And um, he later went on to having quite a career, not only designing the um, State House in Montpelier, Vermont. I, being a native New Hampshire boy, I always enjoy ridding my Vermont friends how it was a New Hampshire architect that designed their beloved State House, even though it burned in 1857, but the colonnade across the front is the, is the original building. But this building is just a magnificent piece of architecture, Greek Revival architecture, that stood on North, um, uh, Main Street, just north of present-day Parkhurst Hall, uh, between Parkhurst and Crosby Hall. The site is now a parking lot, but the proportioning and whatever on this building is just, in my opinion, magnificent, and you can see a close similarity to, uh, to uh, uh, Reed Hall across on the easterly side. And, however, in 1949, Moore's Indian Charity School finally closed and Dartmouth had this building and no one knew quite what to do with it. Well, along came a gift from a fellow by the name of Bill Chandler of Walpole, New Hampshire. He was not a Dartmouth alum, uh, he was a Harvard grad, but nonetheless, uh, living in the Connecticut River Valley, on his death, he bequeathed to Dartmouth College $50,000 to establish a school at Dartmouth College to provide instruction, as I've copied here from his will, practical, practical or useful arts of life composed chiefly in the branches of mechanical arts, engineering, so forth and so forth and so on. It was a curricula not too different from the state school. And Dartmouth debated over whether to accept this gift or not, but being in rather tight financial straits, it decided it couldn't turn down $50,000, which was a hell of a sum of money in those days. And they figured that they would, they would set up this school as a separate school as part of the uh, Dartmouth campus. And it would be a good use for the old Moore's uh, Academy building, which was by then sitting vacant. So it was clear that um, even though, um, and then furthermore, which really irked um, uh, President Bartlett at Dartmouth, but nonetheless, Mr. Chandler stipulated that no other higher preparatory studies are to be required in order to enter the department or school other than are pursued in the common schools of New England. So in other words, to get into the Chandler School, which was part of Dartmouth, you did not have to have as great an academic, uh, uh, educational standing and achievement as to get into Dartmouth. And this really irked uh, President Bartlett, who in addition to letting the Ag students know that they were not Dartmouth students and were not getting Dartmouth degrees, he also let the Chandler School students know the same thing, that they were somehow inferior, but yet uh, the Chandler School was a success. And in some ways it was competing with the agricultural school uh, down on South Park Street. Um, nonetheless, by 1871, the former Moore's Academy building had now become to be called Chandler Hall and was substantially renovated, including a new third floor at a cost of over $7,000. So poor Amy Young's beautifully proportioned Academy building, about the only thing left of it were these window openings, but it got dolled up with a um, French style or second empire style third floor with a mansard roof and bracketry and all of the uh, popular architectural trimmings of the day. It was actually kind of a, kind of a you know, uh, ingenious makeover of a building that was horribly out of style by then and frowned upon by um, a younger generation. Finally, and, and then finally in 1893, with the arrival of President Tucker, and his undertaking to really modernize the Dartmouth campus and curriculum, uh, they finally dismantled the Chandler School academically and included it all within the Dartmouth curriculum. And that was in 1893 when Dartmouth moved from a very classical education to a modern liberal arts education as, as it's today. But at any rate, the Chandler Hall building lived on 
and was again remodeled in 1898 after receiving a $28,000 gift from an alumni. And there are varying opinions as to the beauty of this building, but it sort of took another step at being further embellished with architectural trimming and style that was popular at the time. And here it is with porches on the front, porches on the side, and then a great big addition on the back. It had been quite a transformation of Amy Young's originally, original Greek revival style academy building. Finally, in, 18, in 1936, the building was once again not being used. It was old and antiquated. The college didn't know what to do with it. So it voted to have the building demolished. And the uh, minutes from the trustees meeting where that was authorized made the comment that Culver Hall was quote, unquestionably the ugliest building in Hanover. And here it is being dismantled. In the back, you can see Hitchcock. And I think that's Russell Sage. And then there's the backside of Crosby Hall. So a fascinating trip of how architectural styles evolve and how different generations look at different uh, styles of architecture and buildings. But the poor thing was finally put out of its misery uh, in its 100th year. So let's now turn our attention to the Dartmouth Medical School and to the Mary Hitchcock Memorial Hospital. Again, this is sort of an architectural tour and um, and you know, so many of these buildings I've been looking at for so long, even though they were gone by the time I came around or many of them were, but nonetheless, you know, I've been studying them so long now, they're almost like old friends. And I just love seeing them and love talking about them. And, uh, and so um, something that some of you will recognize and there's some that none of us will recognize or hardly, but so the Dartmouth Medical School just very quickly was established in 1797 by Dr. Nathan Smith of Cornish, New Hampshire. And it is the third oldest medical school in America. Um, uh, Smith went on to establish three other medical colleges. Uh, I can't remember, I, I think uh, Yale and Harvard were already existent, I think. Um, but nonetheless, uh, quite, a, quite a driven fellow uh, who for the first decade or so, he was, the Dartmouth Medical School with a using a classroom in, uh, in Dartmouth Hall. Finally, in 1809, the New Hampshire legislature appropriated $3,450 to construct this very simple, but very nice. Uh, I like this building, um, you know, uh, uh, building for the college or for the medical school on the east side of North College Street, almost across from uh, the present day White Church sat up on a knoll. We'll see some additional pictures will, will better help you uh, orient yourself. Uh, the building ended up costing over $1,200 more. It got into quite a wrangle with the state legislature, which I guess was just as flinty then as it is now. And uh, it, it took a while to get it unsorted uh, and to get everyone settled up. But nonetheless, the uh, building was a well-built building and well-received. Uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Nathan Smith was uh, finally got disgruntled and, and uh, moved on from, from Hanover, but the college, um, the college remained, medical school remained. In 1871, there is a $12,000 gift from a lawyer in New York City by the name E.W. Sauten, and it was to substantially renovate the, uh, the building to what you see here, and I'm sure there are some of you watching who can now remember this building, but it uh, basically uh, gutted out the center of the original um, 1809 building and um, uh, added a third floor and this ingenious so-called lantern uh, to uh, illuminate the interior of the building. It was a very, very ingenious makeover in my opinion. And uh, someone, the architect, we don't know who it was that handled this renovation, certainly had some fun and, uh, and, and good for that person. Um, I'll come back to this in a bit, but you'll notice up on the College Park, up near Bartlett Tower and whatever in the background is a, on the right-hand side, there's a cute little summer house. We'll, as since we're visiting pieces of lost architecture, we'll come back to that in a minute. 
So quite a substantial makeover. And here's the building from the uphill side. Uh, this is College Street or North College Street down below. This building still stands at 42 uh, College Street. The white church is over to the, to the um, uh, left of, of this view. And the future hospital is over in this area, Occam Ridge, et cetera, to the right. But again, kind of a kind of an ingenious makeover, and and really kind of a kind of a curious uh, makeover, if you ask me. Um, here's a, a laboratory room inside where dissections were undertaken. You can see it's nice and clean with uh, all medical equipment and um, and storage for implements, etc. Uh, sort of state of the art facility in its day. And then, um, let me get rid of that thing. Nope. Um, up to the gallery, up in the uh, upper lantern of the building, uh, very nice or ornamental stairs going up to a gallery that round its, wound its way around the lantern where there were books and display cases of artifacts, uh, probably seeing things like pickled brains and jars and who knows what else. It's a medical college after all. And then you can see the interior of the uh, lantern and just the great abundance of light that that brought into the upper part of the uh, building. Really kind of a, kind of a fun building. And uh, in 1907, an addition was put onto it. And I'm sure there are some of you who remember this as well. Uh, this was to the north side. If you were standing uh, down on North College Street, looking at the original building, this would have been to the left of the original building. And this is another view of both buildings where you can just barely see that 1907 building um, to the far left. And then here's the uh, final evolution of the original building. And this was taken just before the buildings were raised in uh, 1963. I can remember drive, riding by in the car with my parents going out to, or I think my oldest brother going out to Storrs Pond and uh, seeing this thing being smashed down. By then it was just an old obsolete building that no one really cared too much about. There's some greenhouse additions that have been made to the easterly side. Um, present day Burke uh, chemistry building uh, occupies the site next to the true confession here to the immediate right of this building was uh, a very early house that has been moved now three times. It's now out on, uh, on a Lime, uh, Lime Road uh, just before the intersection of, uh, of um, Reservoir Road. But my, my grade school girlfriend, Sarah Scottford lived in the house and we used to, I used to go over there and play and whatever. And we were always sort of lollygagging around this arc of a building that was the uh, medical school. So with that little trip down memory lane, we'll finally turn our attention to the Mary Hitchcock Memorial Hospital, which was in existence from 1893 to 1995. And I'm sure there are many of you who can remember it, but we're gonna take a look at the early uh, hospital, which was really a very, very fascinating building. But since about 1850 and for about 20 years, there was a hospital in Hanover that was a private organization run by Dr. Dixie Crosby, who was uh, not only a physician, but he was uh, a professor of medicine at uh, Dartmouth Medical School and quite an accomplished individual. But he owned this house that you see that's still standing uh, just to the north of the White Church um, at 42 uh, College Street, North College Street. And so for about 20 years, he on his own and with the assistance of some of the others from the medical school, did it around Hanover's first hospital. It wasn't much, but it, uh, it, it uh, nonetheless deserves being mentioned as Hanover's first hospital. So think of that when you drive by um, and uh, think of the building. So the Hitchcocks, and I, I'm trying to work with starting a conversation with the present day medical center about doing a nice pictorial history of the original hospital complex 
um, uh, and uh, because it's a fascinating history. And, um, you know, architects like my father left their mark on it. And um, as we'll discuss towards the end of this program, I was the one who signed the demolition permit for its implosion, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. So Hiram and Mary Maynard Hitchcock, uh, they were, uh, you know, sweethearts from grade school, high school. Uh, well, they didn't go to high school. Well, he did, but she didn't. Uh, but they were from Drewsville, New Hampshire, which is a rural part, rural village area, Walpole, New Hampshire, right on the Connecticut River, across from um, uh, uh, Bellows Falls. And um, they married uh, in the, when they were in their late teens, early 20s, and uh, went off to uh, New Orleans, where he got into the hotel business. And apparently, he was a pretty, pretty savvy guy. Uh, as I say, he, I don't know if he got a high school diploma, but he did go to uh, uh, Black River Academy in Ludlow, uh, uh, Vermont, uh, as did President Calvin Coolidge and some other notables from the area. Uh, but as a young man, uh, married with his wife, Mary, who was a very gracious, very hospitable uh, woman, off they went to, um, to uh, New, New Orleans. Uh, by the late 1850s, they, let me roll this thing the right way. They had made a considerable, well, by the early 1860s, I should say, they had made a considerable money, a sum of money in uh, developing, being uh, investors and developers in the Fifth Avenue Hotel in New York City, which you'll see an image of in a minute. But nonetheless, um, they were still pretty young when they chose to retire from the, hospi from the um, hospitality industry. And um, since they were from the upper Connecticut River Valley, I think it was sort of returning home for them. And so they bought this magnificent house that was only then maybe five years old or so, uh, located on North uh, Main Street, uh, right on Tuck, where Tuck Drive now runs. Uh, but it was quite an estate that had been built by Reverend Henry Fairbanks in 1864. He was a um, um, uh, minister and uh, uh, teacher, uh, professor at, uh, at Dartmouth and was of the Fairbanks uh, scale family from St. Johnsbury. Uh, and we don't know who the architect was for his house, but it was certainly as substantial a house as there was in downtown Hanover in that day. And all of the land from around the house and from basically North Main Street, um, you know, in front of uh, the west entrance of Baker Library, all the way down to the river uh, was part of this estate. And uh, that's how Dartmouth acquired all of that land uh, after Hitch Hitchcock's death in the early uh, 1900s. But nonetheless, uh, so they retired, he became a Dartmouth trustee and um, uh, became a, a member of the, he ran for the uh, legislature and served in the New Hampshire legislature for many years. Uh, were very civically minded people and very, very gracious, hospitable hosts. Uh, they were really just, I, you know, every indication is just as delightful and genuine a couple as one could ever want to meet. And they were deeply committed to each other. They'd had two daughters who both had died um, in, in, in very young years. So they were without children. Um, here is uh, an engraving of the Fifth Avenue Hotel in New York City, which opened in 1859 and was considered as fine a hotel as it was in North America at the time. And Hitchcock was an investor in this. And you talk about someone being at the right time in the right place. Um, the building finally became obsolete and was raised in 1908, but it was known as having the first elevator in, uh, in North America, steam powered and uh, having flush toilets inside and a functioning plumbing system. I mean, this was, it just didn't get any better than this folks, but it gave um, Hiram Hitchcock considerable fortune. So his wife unexpectedly dies uh, in 1887 and Hiram is just distressed over this. He gave a considerable sum of money to the White Church, which was then on, um, on uh, Wentworth Street facing the green, 
for an extension of the church to the back with a new organ and having the church gussied up and was giving money kind of freely and uh, but still wasn't satisfied. So there had been formed by a group of docs, um, the, um, uh, I think it was the Hanover Hospital Association, if I'm not mistaken. And it was with the idea of somehow eventually getting a proper hospital facility built in Hanover in concert with the medical school. They had acquired a, a five acre parcel of land out on the outskirts of the village, on the north end of the village, beyond what was then pretty much settled. And as you can see here, um, here is Maynard Street, which had not yet been built. And here is all of uh, Ockham Ridge, which had not been developed. It was still all farmland, as was this property, this five acre parcel that they uh, acquired. Didn't know what they were going to do with it, but hopefully attract somebody who could they could convince to build a hospital. And this was also before ba uh, Baker um, Occam Pond was done, but we'll get to that in a minute. So they talked Herm Hitchcock into providing the funding to build a absolute true state of the art hospital facility, uh, as good as anything then existing in North America. And we'll sort of get to in a minute. Um, why I say that. But it was, as you see here, looking from uh, Bartlett Tower up in the College Park, shortly after the building was uh, opened in May 3rd, 1893. Um, and how, again, it's out in the, out in the sticks. I, I get a kick out of it. The Ropeferry Road had come to be called formally Ropeferry Road, but there were still no houses on it. But its older name was, was Stump uh, Road or Stump Lane because when all of this property was cleared uh, in the late 18th century, uh, what do you do with stumps? You pull them out of the ground and you drag them to the edge of the field and you sort of put them upright and they serve as fencing. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, Rope Ferry Road, which was an early uh, road down to where there was a seasonal rope ferry down at the mouth of Girl Brook was lined with stumps to keep livestock out of, uh, out of uh, fields, et cetera, et cetera, but we digress. So um, we don't know exactly how much the hospital building cost Hitchcock. He paid for all the bills directly uh, and the New Hampshire, the Hanover Hospital Association uh, was dissolved and the Mary Hitchcock Memorial Hospital Corporation was formed um, with him as a director but it's estimated that he spent in excess of $200,000, which was a fabulous sum of money. That's back when, you know, maybe a good two-story wood-framed house in the village might cost you $1,500, $2,000. So it gives you some idea of, of the magnitude of wealth that Hitchcock had and what he spent as a memorial, a fitting memorial to his beloved Mary. By the way, there's that little, I, you know, since we were looking from the college park, I just couldn't help myself, but, you know, putting this image in of this delightful little uh, summer pavilion that was right at the height of land where you could look out over the Ag College as well as out over what became um, Occam Ridge and all of that, look into the hills of Vermont, but sort of a delightful little structure, sweet as can be. So I say this was an exceptionally an innovative building, that is the hospital. Um, uh, Rand and Taylor were very noted architects from Boston who were sort of on the forefront of hospital uh, design. Um, we think that um, uh, how, how Harum Hitchcock came to know of them was because he was on the governor's council in the late 1880s uh, and New Hampshire built a, um, um, a part of its um, insane asylum, quite frankly, uh, but it was a very innovative building that, that um, uh, Rand and Taylor designed. And so we think that's probably how uh, Hitchcock came in, in, in touch with uh, these architects. And actually both Mr. Taylor and Mr. Rand were originally from the St. Johnsbury Coventry area of Vermont in the Northeast Kingdom, even though they had long left there for the uh, greener pastures of Boston. 
But the uh, building is really an exceptionally well done example of sort of what's called Beaux-Arts classicism. And it's sort of based on the architecture of the early Italian Renaissance. And a building had just been designed by um, uh, McKim, Mead and White, uh, which was the new Boston Public Library, which was done in this early Italian Renaissance style. And it was really quite a building, it still is to this day. And it sort of set a new direction for architecture um, you know, in, uh, in America. Um, and one of the things that you'll notice about uh, this building, and I was hoping to be able to have floor plans, but if I get a chance to do my really good history working with the hospital, uh, I know they have early, uh, uh, copies of the original drawings that I could get scanned and all. But you know, our, this, this is a very symmetrical building. And that was not necessarily the style of the day and it set a new direction. Uh, asymmetrical, irregular layouts, you know, Queen Anne architecture and some of the French style, Mansard, et cetera. That was all based upon more random, irregular plans. Whereas this building, as we'll, we'll see, was very, very symmetrical and logical in its layout. Uh, and it really consisted of four buildings or pavilions. In the center, as we will see, was the administration building. And then uh, there were a men's ward, there was a woman's ward, ward, and then there was a surgical building, which is my favorite, uh, out in the rear. And this was all of fireproof construction. Um, it utilized a new uh, structural system, an Italian uh, system that we'll get to in a minute. So the whole building was fireproof. Um, the first building, hospital building of its type in North America to be so, so constructed. And it had very advanced heating and ventilating systems in its day so that it, they could use steam in the summertime to set up air currents to ventilate the wards as well as to distribute heat in the wintertime. And it used electric lighting, which was then just becoming common uh, in, uh, in this part of the world. So really a, a fascinating building in that regard. So here's how the new building looked upon completion. Uh, this is looking from the corner of Maynard Street and Rope Ferry Road. And to the left or west is the men's uh, ward pavilion. And to the far right is the women's ward uh, with the administration building in the, in the center. This building and, uh, and we'll discuss the, uh, the wards a little bit more, but this piece still remains to this day. And a little bit of this uh, connecting sunroom, which we'll discuss more in a minute, remains. Otherwise, the rest of it uh, was raised when the, um, when the rest of the hospital complex was taken down. Here's another view standing from out in the newly completed Maynard Street. We know where the word name Maynard comes from. But again, here's the men's pavilion, wards pav um, a women's pavilion, and then attached with these beautifully sunlit um, 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 hallways, uh, pavilions. Um, I think I, yeah, okay. Uh, here is the easterly side uh, of the, again, the front pavilion with um, room for, with private rooms behind it. And then as we'll see in a minute, a beautiful conservatory. And then this was the operating um, uh, building, surgical building as it was called, with a private door for medical school students and physicians to come and go and not have to come through the rest of the hospital if they didn't wish. And again, it was set up that recognizing that with the medical hospital, uh, with the medical school, it was only appropriate that the Mary Hitchcock be formed as a teaching hospital. So right from the start, teaching and instruction in medical sciences was an integral part of the planning and construction uh, of, this, of this facility. Here's a close up of the easterly side, and we'll see this rotunda in a, in a minute inside this dome. But again, all beautiful brickwork, granite work, uh, some sandstone. Um, it, it was, there was heavy oak trim inside, but that was the only wood 
construction in the building. But uh, really some beautiful detail work. Uh, coming around the back side, um, I know there are some of you will still remember some of this portion of the building that you know, if you knew where to look, you could still find it even after all of Faulkner House had been built, et cetera. But this administration building was um, down in the basement level where laundries uh, and, uh, and kitchens. And then up on the main floor were the superintendent's office, as we'll see in a minute, uh, reception area, uh, and then dining rooms on the first floor. Up on the second floor, uh, private rooms. And then on the third floor, quarters for the nurses on the second, or back second, and up on the third floor, quarters for the nurses. Here's just one last view before we go inside, taken uh, looking across the newly created uh, Occam Pond, created in 1900 by damming up sort of a swampy, marshy area, um, and uh, one of Hanover's great assets. But here's the back side. Here's the uh, uh, here's Rope Ferry Road coming along, and the back side of the uh, surgical building, back side of the administration building, and then the back side of the uh, original men's ward. The first addition to be put on the building was in 1913, the sort of Don Hitchcock uh, wing, which is also still standing, and basically matched the architecture of the original building. So let's go inside. The building was set well back from Maynard Street. So there was a quite a, a, a beautiful circular driveway and, and uh, landscaping. So your carriage could pull up or later your automobile pull up to this uh, front entrance port cochere so that you could come in under, under, uh, under cover. But again, just look at the magnificent detailing uh, of all of this. Uh, I was uh, fortunate in being able to get one of the uh, pieces, one of the uh, brackets, cornice brackets, which was all of um, uh, molded terracotta uh, and is on a shelf here in my office. Um, so going inside, there's the front entrance porch and you can see this masonry vaulting. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this, but um, making this building entirely fireproof. But this is inside the, uh, the entrance porch, just up from the Port Cochere. And here we are coming into the central rotunda. Much of this remained intact until uh, the building's final days, although it was slowly getting mutilated as, as need be. I mean, you know, uh, making changes over the years. But nonetheless, uh, here's the central uh, rotunda with the stair, the original stair going up. By the time I can remember, it had become enclosed for fire rating purposes. And this delightful little Ingle Nook memorial area to, um, to uh, Mary Hitchcock, there's her portrait. And there's a plaque. And as you'll see in the next view, um, another view of the Ingle Nook. And of course, uh, uh, thankfully, all of this was removed and carefully reinstalled in the new hospital. Uh, which I think was a very, very nice gesture. This is all Sienna marble, beautifully polished, the mantle. And as I say, this plaque by Harem to his beloved wife and a picture of his beloved wife. Here's the uh, superintendent's office on the uh, left-hand side. Uh, I get a kick out of the early uh, use of electrical wire. <coughs> Uh, nonetheless, we're not here on a building code review. And then across from the superintendent's office on the right side, uh, you know, is a workroom uh, for meetings, uh, et cetera. All quarter, quarter sawn oak uh, trim and doors. Uh, here's the doctor and nurse's dining room, which was sort of behind the ingle nook. Uh, and again, I remember walking through the building just before it was about to be demolished. And this mantelpiece was all beautiful um, glazed tile pieces uh, imported from uh, Italy. And I've got uh, the emblem out of the center uh, and I've got a several of the 
of the mantle pieces. They're in beautiful condition sitting next to that piece of cornice. I mean, I just, this building, I can remember, you know, as um, being very young and being at desk 200, there were two, two, two pediatrician uh, doctors, uh, Dr. Stewart and Dr. Stores. And my doctor was Dr. Stewart. And I remember as a real little kid, you look out the window of his office and you look down onto the center building, which of course in the 1950s looked horribly archaic. But I remember asking my mother about it. And, you know, of course my, my mother and father's generation didn't think much of this architecture. So, you know, but regardless, here's up on the second floor of the main administration building where uh, there were private rooms. You see fireplaces. They use the fireplaces for both, you know, uh, ambiance uh, and uh, and uh, as well as for ventilation. So here we are, in, as I say, uh, one of the sunrooms that connected the um, uh, ward pavilions with the main building. A piece of this still remains uh, on the west, uh, the, the west ward. Um, and I'm sure many of you remember when these were still. Uh, uh, still part of the uh, complex. But again, a very revolutionary idea that people who were convalescing and uh, could you know, enjoy abundant sunshine and uh, fresh air, uh, as opposed to being closed up in a, in a stuffy room somewhere. And this was, this was designed, this building was designed when hospitals were still a real novelty. Uh, most people didn't go to hospitals. They didn't trust hospitals. Hospitals were a whole new way of life. So, you know, it was, it was revolutionary all the way around, whether it be its architecture, its construction, its layout. Um, here we are in one of the two wards. Uh, each were originally designed with nine beds around a central chimney, which had fireplaces for, again, just ambience and, and uh, uh, look of hospitality and warmth, as well as in the summertime using them for uh, ventilation shafts in a very unique way. Uh, introducing steam into the chimney flues so that it would excite the air and then that would start an airflow through the building. Um, again, very revolutionary thinking. Um, and here's the underside of one of those pavilions. And again, it was known as the Gostovino Structural Fireproofing Building System. And it was a patented system uh, developed by the Gostovino family. And this was the first building in North America to use it. But it was all based upon uh, clay tile masonry uh, in arches and brick buttresses, et cetera. So that's why, and I say this whole building was fireproof. It was indeed fireproof. No structural wood framing at all in any part of the building. And then you can see uh, the state of the art for the day, mechanical systems of pipes and ducts to get steam through to either ventilate the building in the summertime or to heat it in the wintertime. Um, there were connected to each of the two ward pavilions. Uh, there were four private rooms on each side for patients. And the hallways uh, to those private rooms, uh, which also included bathing areas and uh, other, other uh, housekeeping areas. Uh, this, the hallways were lit with skylights, which could also serve to help ventilate. And then uh, going down on the easterly side of the building to the uh, surgical wing was a conservatory. There was a corridor that passed by the conservatory and that's what we see here on the right-hand side. Um, but then on the left-hand, on the easterly side, um, catching the easterly morning sun was this magnificent uh, conservatory. Um, it was believed that having a place of where one could go and you know, be amongst plants and living things was, was, was healthy and wise, or where there could be in the patient's rooms, fresh um, uh, flowers uh, to, to help brighten the mood. And uh, uh, again, very revolutionary thinking. And then we get into the operating theater, which I think is one of the most fascinating aspects of the building. Um, it was designed so that, again, as I've said, surgeons and medical students could come and go and not be um, disruptive of the rest of the hospital. Uh, but the operating theater was designed with tiered uh, seating 
so that uh, it could accommodate 150 uh, students uh, on the on the uh, lower level, uh, you know, ser- seats for the surgeons or their assistants, the operating table in the center, and then uh, these tiered balconies, semicircular balconies going up um, for seating for the medical students. And then in the center of the whole thing, this magnificent masonry dome with a skylight so that there was both artificial lighting as well as natural lighting coming down onto the operating um, uh, area. Here's another view sort of looking westerly uh, and to the right, is, you can see the operating table and the chairs we were just speaking of and the afternoon sun coming in through the large window opening. A couple more views of the uh, operating theater. Again, very, very unique uh, construction. That beautiful, magnificent masonry dome, skylight, and uh, um, unfortunately, the exposure is not as great with these photographs. And here we have an operation in progress with doctors, nurses, and observant medical school students looking on from above. As I say, it was total seating capacity was 150. Um, but this was, uh, and this is only shortly after, you know, the invention of uh, x-rays and ether. And uh, I mean, this is when modern medicine was in its infancy. So, you know, to see this with the architecture, I think is really very fascinating. So here's the Mary Hitchcock Memorial Hospital as it appeared by 1943, its 50th anniversary. The first change that was made was the operating theater soon became very obsolete. And so that was removed by, I know it was gone by 1920 and it might've been a little bit earlier than that. And then of course, as I said earlier, um, the uh, um, uh, uh, Don Hitchcock Ward, which is still standing on Ropeferry Road, that was, that was added in 1913. So that was the first thing to be added to the original complex. And then shortly thereafter, um, uh, the original um, uh, operating theater building was taken down and um, I'm not sure some of you might know which building, what this building eventually was called. I mean, these buildings had, had an assortment of names that I uh, re- escaped me in this hour of the evening. Uh, and then in 1927, uh, the, uh, after the clinic had been organized, uh, this building uh, was added, uh, which is still standing uh, as part of uh, the Dartmouth um, uh, complex. Uh, and of course, here's this beautiful front spacious lawn. This is before Faulkner House had been built. Also interesting here, you see um, North uh, College Street disappearing around the corner, heading towards Lime, Lime Road. And here's the Dewey Farm, uh, the Dewey's farmhouse and their collection of barns. So the Dewey Farm, uh, which was functioning into the 1940s, uh, came up to the edge of the hospital's property. Uh, also, you can see Billings Lee, which was built in, I think, 22, and then Dick's House, which was built uh, uh, in um, 1926, I believe. I'll have to look at my own books. Across the street, uh, the Guile family built this house in, I think, 1896, uh, which uh, stood until quite recently, known as Fowler House. Uh, but uh, kind of a different view than what we came to be used to seeing. So 1952, uh, new Faulkner House uh, front edition was completed. I remember going and seeing Dr. Stewart here and uh, up on the second floor, guest 200. Um, but this really, the hospital knew it had to, it had to do something. It needed to either grow and keep up with the rapid advancements that were occurring in medicine with a, with a more state-of-the-art facility. Otherwise, um, it's, its chances of survival, quite frankly, you know, were somewhat questionable. And so I always thought that architecturally with a very limited budget, um, this was a, a very successful addition, but it soon came to be over, overcome, overdone by 
the expansion that started in the late 60s and was finished by 1972, um, where they pushed Faulkner House to its limits, 400 inpatient beds, and it was the largest facility by then between Boston and um, uh, Burlington, Vermont. <clears throat> so this is the hospital has ended up uh, as, as many of us remember it. Uh, my dad did a two-story radiology addition in the early 70s, early to mid 70s out here. Um, he, as an architect, was always a little bit more touchy about people messing with, their, with his buildings than I am. My feeling is you hire me as an architect, if you pay the bill and you know, owner take, take decent care of the building, do with it what you want. My father was not quite so generous. And, uh, and plus being a 13th generation New England Yankee, just blowing up or getting rid of a building he had a hard time with, but um, he wasn't pleased when I told him that I stopped by one day and was watching them take down the two-story radiology edition, which was not part of what was imploded in 1995. And he wasn't too happy to hear that. Oh, well. And of course we remember this day, uh, exactly 7.30, Saturday morning, September 9th, 1995, 750 explosive charges consisting of 500 uh, pounds of dynamite and in seven seconds collapsed. And it was the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. It collapsed, you know, 340 square feet of structure and 16,500 cubic feet of steel and concrete. Um, the radiology addition uh, did not get imploded and was sort of behind this, uh, these trees and later got smashed by equipment much to my father's disgust, as I said. So, and this was probably, this, this took place during a time when I was the town of Hanover's planning, zoning and building code administrator. And it was probably the most unique permit that I ever issued, ever signed. Uh, and that was for the implosion, the demolition of, of this building. You know, as I say, my father had left his mark on, on actually many smaller additions to it and, and modifications to it. And, uh, then uh, I uh, signing its death warrant, but nonetheless, it was the end of an era. So we'll go out with a bang as it were. So um, and as I said, Barbara, feel free to use any of these images, share any of this with anyone that uh, you wish, uh, and I'll make sure you get a, a nice, uh, uh, a, high, a good quality um, uh, print of the, of the whole thing as a booklet.